What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. This is the Deep Corner, episode 22. I'm Rob St. Clair, and a special guest today from Southern California, the rising tide, Mr. Ryan Windish. Welcome to the show. How's it going, guys? Thanks for hopping on with me, buddy. Uh, a lot, of, a lot I want to get to. For uh, you're a cool story and a, another SoCal JUCO product, like a couple I've had on the show so far. But you, in particular, now you're actually the head coach at Irvine Valley, where you played a couple years at JUCO. So, uh, first of all, what can you do as the head coach while we're all like kind of sheltered in place right now? You can't get in the gym, work with your kids. So, uh, what is there that you can do? Well, um, with JUCO, we're in a little bit of a different situation where the kids are all in the volleyball class. My guys are still taking volleyball as a class. They're going to get a grade. They're going to get units for it. So keeping them on top of that, you know, just holding them accountable is big. The biggest thing is their end goal is transferring, get into the four year. And just because everybody else is paused right now doesn't mean we're allowed to pause. They are finishing finals start today. Finish their finals, get those grades. You know, if some kids were accepted into those four years, they're making their decisions moving forward. But the biggest thing is on their end goal, which is for most of them the four year level playing or academically. Yeah, which is a really interesting, very unique coaching position for you because like a lot of like, you know, standard coaches at the college level are like, all right, I'm developing my players for myself to have for three or four years. Uh, but you are in a different situation because you're like, I, my, your goal is to develop kids to get out of there, to transfer, which is exactly what you did. So uh, you have a, a unique perspective on kind of the whole SoCal collegiate volleyball system because you played, was it one year at IVC or two? Yeah, just one year. Okay, and then you went to Long Beach State. You successfully made the jump to, to four-year and had a pretty good career. I know you were starting pretty much every match your senior year right until you got hurt. So uh, you're a success story of the JUCO system. Um, what was what, what was the jump like from JUCO to Long Beach State? Uh, the jump was, you know, interesting. Uh, from club to IVC, I felt the level of play would, would jump quite a bit and – in a way, it did. The guys were a little bit more physical. Definitely, I had a couple guys there. Um, I came onto a team that just won a state championship, so uh, the expectations were high. And then the jump from IVC to Long Beach State was even greater because, like you talked about, it's, it's a long process. I, the coach knows, you know, it was Alan Knipe right when he got back from the That's Special Olympics, mm -hmm. and he begins to build his program up again. And being a part of that was you know, an amazing experience. It's the reason I'm coaching. Um, the jump from IBC to Long Beach State is the reason I'm coaching. But volleyball wise, I felt like I was learning how to ride a bike or learning how to pass a ball for the very first time. Um, you know, the things I was told, I've never been told before, never been able to look at things or volleyball uh, that way until I got to Long Beach State. And now it's only I see. Okay, get into that a little bit more, like from the perspective of playing libero, because you're actually the first libero I've had on the show, which is a crime. I, I love love talking to liberos and hearing like from about the game from their perspective, because it's really the position that I understand the least. Uh, but like like you said, there was a, there was kind of a physical difference when you got to IVC from having played you know high school club just in kind of size and I assume hitting and serving speed. But at Long Beach, it's kind of a different story. Like you, you talked about breaking down your passing and kind of building it up from the beginning. Was that because of just how you were being served at? Or talk about that a little bit more for like people who understand the libero position. Yeah, well, I mean, my, my big saying is liberos are people too. Uh, <laughs> we, we aren't just the guy that wears the different color jersey. Um, I'm pretty sure I, I, I yelled that at refs a few times <laughs> because of whatever calls. But uh, the instead of just looking at passing individually, you know, the responsibilities, you know, now it's a little bit more present were shown to me in a way that I haven't seen it before. Sure. I was going around, I was free passing every ball, doing what I can. I had really no rules. And so the first thing we did when we got to Long Beach, there was probably, a, you know, I was just a walk on. We probably had four or five, six other liberos in the gym and each position group was set up to design a job. And just by breaking down our job description of more than pass the ball, dig the ball, it was run the throw. 
So it's kind of being a supporting role to everybody else. And so uh, when I got to Long Beach, I, I realized that it's more than just me. It was, I'm doing this so everybody else can do their job and put everything in a bigger perspective. Okay, uh, your your audio cut out a little bit there in the middle, but I think I got the gist of what you're saying. That's that you know you were, you know, at, in JUCO you were kind of free to kind of run around the court and do your thing, but you you said it was broken down by job description at Long Beach, and then uh, I think people who have played volleyball at a pretty high level understand how important the libero is and what their what they can do to make all of their teammates around them better, whether that's take up fifty percent of the court and serve receive or be a reliable second setter to run kind of an offense when the setter takes first ball or whatever. Uh, that it's, it's cool to hear that that's like, that was expanded upon once you got to the, the division one level that the, the libero position can be that much more than just a passer and a defender. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, now as a coach too, looking at it, I hold my liberos definitely to a higher standard than um, I would have if I wasn't. And it's hopefully rubbing off on them and, making them feel a little bit more self-confident nowadays. Yeah, and I wanted to ask about how having played libero influences you as a coach because liberos don't hit, they don't block. Uh, it, at the highest levels of men's, they don't serve. Uh, you set, but in a different way than a setter does. Uh, but like as a head coach, you're kind of responsible for teaching all those skills to all the positions. Um, what's What's that like having played libero and having now to see and coach all positions because I know you've you've seen the game at every level at every position but you haven't necessarily done it what's that kind of like yeah I think the biggest thing and other liberos out there can attest that when we break off to do drills whether it's a, anything but you know the liberos are, are kind of forgotten hitting drills blocking drills whatever and I think that especially my three years at Long Beach I took the time to find a way to understand what my teammates' jobs were. Um, that way, once the team, you know, we're in the match, I could have a conversation with them of what they're seeing, why they're doing it, and then tell them what I'm seeing. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I need to be perfect so, because to set the middle, you got to have basically a perfect pass. But I'm listening to what uh, the coach is saying to the setters, to the middles, why they're doing it doing it because they say so finding out that why was huge and then blocking wise uh, as a defender it made things easier when i knew what the blockers were seeing sure i was looking at what i was going to do stuff or make my adjustments whatever but if i know what the blockers are going to do i'm going to be one step ahead and so i think that both offensively block and defensive wise understanding the roles around me uh, made it easier to transition into coaching. That's all I was looking at since my job description was to support their jobs. And that's kind of how things um, now as a coach. Cool. Yeah, it's you do have kind of the best seat in the house to, especially to your, your teammates blockers, you can see everything that's going on up there and you obviously have to respond to that to, to do your job. But that, that's that's kind of cool is that you can sit back there and understand kind of the flow of traffic, so to speak. And then when you transition to coaching, you now have the, the view to direct the traffic from the sidelines. That's a that's kind of a cool switch. So yeah, uh, definitely. I, I have Sorry, a, yeah, I have I have a homework assignment for everybody that's watching this right now. And that's uh, go to the Rising Tides Instagram uh, at Rising Tide VB, I think. And scroll down a little bit, and there was a play from last year when you were playing a match. It's one of the like weirdest, crazy scramble plays I've ever seen, and uh, you ended up like just setting a ball over the net and scoring a point. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you know the what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. First of all, very rare that a libero gets you know gets a, a one in, in the kill column on the stat sheet. Uh, but that whole play, you were kind of everywhere. You like ran some like dummy fake four ball route, which was hilarious. You dug like an unbelievable ball like hit right at you as I recall uh you were just kind of everywhere like being a libero you know the nature of the position you don't show up on the stat sheet so how how do you like stay 
I don't know, what's what's the mindset into contributing to a team in, in whatever way it takes when it can't necessarily be scoring points? Because I certainly have never been in that spot. Yeah, it's tough. And I mean, the play, I was having fun um, taking care of my job. But at the same time, you know, it's that mindset of doing everything on the court that I can. And I think that now, I mean, I'm not playing anymore, but when I do get the opportunity to play, I kind of have a big bird's eye view of the court. I know it's I can know where the ball is going to be. So it allows me to do fun things like, you know, fake a route. My outside hitter wasn't running his route, so I'm going to fill in uh, for him. Or, you know, I, I kind of just go with the flow of the play um, instead of trying to be so dug in and everything like that. Um, but trying to stay engaged, it, it's tough. You, you know the ball's not going to come to you every single time. But that one time you don't expect the ball to come to you, volley gods know and yep. there they find you not ready so that's right um by just staying active staying moving my big thing i talk non-stop on the court about anything i mean if anything i'm commentating what's going on just to keep that engagement level going and keep my brain going to stay ready for whatever's going to happen cool that's a good way to do it and it's like you were saying the one time you're not in the right spot ball's going there and uh, and I've talked to middles about this same thing because sometimes their influence on the game is is a little bit limited by the nature of the position. But the one block touch they get, like that, I don't know, at twenty two twenty two, they stuff block a ball and serve, or they you know get a nice high soft touch on your side and transition. That if that turns into a point, that changes the match completely. And the same way goes for libero. And like you, maybe a little bit more pressure and service you have to pass nails all the time. But that one like ridiculous dig that you can make at 22 22 if your team transitions into a point that that point is kind of yours and that could be the match so that uh that's the thing about the position i I, at least from from never having played it that's what makes it so cool to me to watch yeah it's tough um a lot of spectators notice the libero's only when they make an error true and mess up or they make the fantastic play um so trying to string together just those good plays, almost going unnoticed, you know, and if you do get noticed, it's because you did something, you know, out of the ordinary or you, you did make an athletic play, but um, you, you got to stay engaged so those errors don't happen. Well, the great ones have no shortage of those athletic plays. And I wanted to ask about like uh, your, your personal favorite liberos you've ever seen or played with. Uh, you got any names to drop that you've like taken some inspiration from? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, the, the big one that I, I love to watch is Grubenikov, the oh. French libero. I mean, obviously, he's arguably the best libero in the world. I, I'd um, give him that. Yeah, so, I mean, he's insane to watch. Um, but, you know, it's after that, um, it, just because he's a Long Beach alum and, you know, he's worked his butt off from nothing. Dusty Watton um, does a lot of great stuff. You know, good friend good you know 49er alumni that we you know I, I really like watching his his path to go but you know my libero friends that you know I, I watch them and I take pride in watching them or knowing them personally of what they do um my roommate in college Andrew Sato you know Brinkley won a couple national championships uh my co-coach Nick Costello I nice. mean going back and watching old film on all of them um knowing I was on the other side of the court was what I like to do is watch them and support, you know, the libero lives matter. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you gotta, you know, you gotta have each other's back. Yeah. That's really cool. All right. So I, I want to talk about rising tide, but before we do that, I've got this little like quick hitting, like hyper fast tempo interview question segment that I've been putting my last couple of people through and it's been fun. I've expanded cool. it a little bit. So I'm going to just hit you with some questions. Give me the first kind of thing. The first quick thing that pops in your head. You ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, early mornings or late nights? Uh, early mornings. Ooh, you're the first person to say that. Uh, what's your favorite pregame like warm up song? Oh man, uh, man, I'm weird. Anything in the country category. Ooh, uh, I can't give one song, but a country guy. Okay, sure. Uh, what's the best day of the week? Uh, game day, whatever day that is, Wednesday or Friday. Great answer. Uh, what's you can do? I mean, you typically do neither of these things. But which one do you like better, stuff block or service ace? Oh, I've gotten a stuff block as a libero before. So no way. <laughs> yeah, I didn't count, but it was on the fourth contact over. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, what's the best post game meal? Best post game meal. 
Uh, I'm all about the burger. Just having a nice big avocado bacon cheeseburger. Solid. Uh, what's the hardest position on the court in volleyball? Middle blocker, 100%. What's your favorite jersey number? Uh, my favorite jersey number will be number one. Me too. Good choice. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. What's your favorite sports team in any in any sport? Boom, right there. Houston Texans. Houston Texans. <laughs> it's funny because on my screen, it like lines up perfectly with the Packers flag I have behind me. <laughs> uh, who's your favorite athlete in, in any sport? Uh, favorite athlete? Um, man, that's tough. Uh, man, I have everything, I guess. At the moment, it would be... You know what? I, I, I got to say because it's all Kobe, just all-time favorite athlete, Kobe Bryant. Great choice. Uh, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Uh, superpower would be to teleport. Nice. I like that one. You could make a lot of plays as Libera if you exactly. teleport. Uh, what sport are you the best at other than volleyball? Hockey. Really? Nine years of hockey. Cool. Uh, beach or mountains? Man, depends on the day, uh, but beach. What's your favorite color? I'd say navy blue. blue. And lastly, uh, which is stronger for you, loving winning or hating losing? Loving winning. Great. Yeah. You awesome. na you nailed it. Uh, the, okay, I, I got to ask about the, the libero getting a block story. Uh, what happened there? Yeah, that was uh, Open Nationals in 2015. Um, I was playing for a team called Virginia Vibe back in the day, a PBL team, and uh, we were playing, and I saw that they were going to have four contacts come over the net, and so I ran up and they set the last guy was setting the ball over just fourth contact just whatever we know we lost the point and i jumped threw it down and then did a <laughs> lap around around the the court all fired up i mean even though it was done you know just got a, got a few laughs you know entertaining the crowd a little bit that's great what i like to do uh, that's that's awesome all right, uh, let, let's talk about the rising tide. So uh, I had Daniel Davidson on the show uh, a week or two or three ago, who was awesome, and everybody needs to go watch that interview. Um, he kind of he founded the rising tide back in the day in the PVL years, and um, is still kind of in like a general manager role, but from afar he's on the East Coast. So you've been the guy who's been more like boots on the ground there in SoCal, kind of building the roster. We're working with Daniel a lot, but. Uh, First of all, uh, what can we expect from you for the Rising Tide? Are you coaching? Are you going to play a little bit or both or what? Uh, the goal is to just coach. Um, I'm hoping to load up enough liberos. You know, I'll maybe have a, a jersey there to pop in as a serving sub. But no, I, I'm looking to, to just coach, be on the bench. Okay, solid. And so who can we expect? Because the Rising t Tide has been, uh, like it was when it was born, it was born on the East Coast because – like Daniel was talking about, it had to be associated with the USAV region. And uh, Dan was in DC at the time, so he picked like the Chesapeake, Maryland, kind of the Bay area. And But when it came to PVL time, the squad was pretty much UC Santa Barbara guys. Uh, so it's had a SoCal attachment for a long time. Uh, but the players, you know, have, have cycled in and out over the years, and you've been kind of in charge of building the roster. So uh, can you give a little bit of a preview of who we're going to see whenever it is that we're allowed to get back on the floor and play some ball? Yeah, um, obviously dates pending and everything um, yeah. with guys going back overseas. I know you've had a Matt August, you know, IBC guy on. Um, so whether he's in USA or, or overseas, you know, well, that's good, you know, to uh, other guys um, we're, we were having is Taylor Hammond, Penn State setter. Nice. Uh, is in Nick Costello, my co-coach, played at UH back in the day. Andrew Sato, Long Beach State, uh, State Libero, uh, Madison Hayden, uh, Stanford, Stanford outside. Um, if we could get Colin out of the gym in Oklahoma, then Colin will, Colin will jump on. And I mean, we got to keep it traditional. Totally. Um, other guys, guys like John LaRouche, uh, Long Beach State opposite hitter. 
um, I don't have the list in front of me. I mean, before all this happened, I was flowing with, with names that was talk I was talking to and it's kind of fizzled out just because the situation, but, um, got a uh, probably Ryan Radira, Brandon directo, oh, right? Course. There's a couple guys. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Radira and directo. Uh, Love those two guys. You know, yeah. They, those two are, are just killing it. Um, so yeah, Ryan will definitely be, be in Jersey directo. will be in a Jersey. Um, and then there's a couple other guys that we're, we're talking with. And like I said, it slowed down a little bit once this all happened. So hopefully some more guys that are still getting quality touches and can provide some good volleyball on the court. Totally. Well, I was like the first time I met director or like saw him play was last year when uh, I can't remember which event it was. But like this, this 5'10 kid is going to play six rotation outside against the big boys. And then I saw him jump and I saw him like run all over the floor and do crazy stuff. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I understand now. So uh, I can't wait to see him play. I know he'll be ready to go. IBC product. That's right. You've got a bunch of them, man. So uh, I wanted to ask about what it's like to be now in a head coaching role, both at IBC and uh, like when we get back out with the rising tide at such a young age for you, because a lot of your players, well, at IBC, they're all younger than you, but, but not by much. And at the rising tide, several of them are probably going to be older than you. Uh, do you think it's easier to coach when you're younger or harder or maybe a little bit of both? Um, I think, you know, cause I've worked with some older coaches and, you know, younger coaches and the way I look at it is there, you know, there's no downside, whether you're older, or younger, but there's only upside. So playing to the strengths is huge. Um, with my kids at IBC and they're not kids, they're adults so yeah. be real here, but, um, I, I still refer to them as my kids with them. You know, I'm able to connect with them a little bit more. Um, I'm not too much older than them. So I've played, you know, closer to the time that they have and the volleyball hasn't really changed. So by, with that, they, I can communicate with them a little bit better. Um, they want to play a little bit newer, quicker, up-tempo volleyball and, you know, in some ways we cater to that a little bit more than, you know, per se old school volleyball. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't want to differentiate the two and this or that, but by combining a hybrid of that, those two things, new school, old school, it's me being able to communicate that with them a little bit easier. My thought process going into the rising tide with guys who have played at the highest level. I mean, some guys playing in the USA gym is more of a, you know, manager on the court. The, a lot of these guys know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, they, I don't need to be teaching them, coaching them. So I'm going to look at it a little bit bigger picture of how I, you know, kind of how I was uh, a libero. How can I support them? What do they need me to watch? You know, what do that? What cannot they, you know, when they're attacking, when they're blocking, when somebody's serving. And so being able to communicate with them and be more of a supporting role is what I was looking to do or what I'm looking to do once that time comes, um, you know, depending on how many we, how many, you know, dates we get, or, you know, even in the next year, of, am I able to develop a scouting report for them? Am I able to develop, you know, tendency reports on the other team that, you know, is going to play to our advantage and help the tide move forward and find those ways to win. Yeah, that's big. That's high level coaching stuff. And I like that because you made a good point. Everybody, that's on that rising tide squad is played at ridiculously high levels and all they need is somebody on the sidelines supporting game managing and showing them things that they can't necessarily see. So that's a good perspective. Another thing I wanted to ask about is about like kind of building team chemistry on the fly because you, you've built a, a good roster with some players that have serious playing resumes and are ballers at their respective levels, but not all of them, have played over together before and some of them probably haven't even met before necessarily. So how, how are you going to approach like building kind of team chemistry on the fly when you don't have all that much time to like get introduced and know each other personally? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. When I was on a call with my club team the other week with uh, John Spraw and he was bringing up an example of, I forget what year it was, but they had a meet in, Italy or somewhere and all the USA guys kind of flew in they've been playing with their club teams and boom they got to play in a you know a whatever qualifying match Not that much time but the point he made was a lot of these guys have played at the highest level done it you know for the most part professionally 
and the other where most of the competition are all the hitters find out what they want and make it happen. The hitters will do the same, you know, with the passers. The middles will always be given feedback. And I think at our level, we're able to give that or have that communication where our egos don't get involved and we're just there to play some volleyball. Uh, we could jump on the court whenever, wherever, and make high-level volleyball happen. Sure, you know, some chemistry will, will be nice and playing together a lot longer, you know, like LVC. I played one year with them, and that their chemistry is insane. That's true. Uh, but, you know, it, it, with our level, I believe that just the upfront, honest communication is how you make chemistry happen on the fly. Yep, well said. It's been said a couple of times on the show that volleyball is kind of its own language. And if you speak it, then you can do it. You can do it at, at whatever whatever level is, is there in front of you at the time. And, you know, sure, team chemistry in the long run might add up to a point or two here and there. But uh, I'm excited about the Tide because it's such, you know, it's, it's what I know the least about what to expect of, of the five teams and I think that's really exciting and I think a lot of people especially in the SoCal area are going to gravitate towards this team because it's going to be so cool and it's going to be really fresh and uh, you guys are going to put on a really good volleyball product whenever it is that we can get out there so uh, before I let you get out of here uh, where can the people follow you where can the people follow you and the team yeah uh, I think you said it earlier Rising Tide has their their Instagram um rising tide vb or something like that i think you can confirm that i think that's right um you know once i'm able to to once we get on the court or anything happens like that ryan radier will be keeping that going you know with up-to-date stuff uh myself i'm on instagram or whatever you don't you know nothing crazy happening there just my life my dog uh <laughs> at tropical windy um, but recently I did start a, a coaching blog and a lot of the stuff we talked about is being put into there. Uh, it's called a coach um, and that's kind of just my mindset on coaching as a whole. So, um, that's kind of how I'm linking myself to the world is through that blog that I created about a month ago. Cool. Uh, say the URL for that again. You, you cut out the audio. I want to make sure people hear wh where they can yeah, find sorry. that. Sorry. It's a coaches pursuit.com. Nice. A coaches pursuit.com. Sweet, yeah, I'm I'm definitely gonna get that, give that a read because uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff you talked about today is is really cool and high level and unique and uh, stuff that a lot of people could afford to read and learn some learn a thing or two about the game, huh? Yeah, just trying to grow the game. That's right. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for joining me, man. Uh, whenever it is we get to get out on the court and see you on the sidelines or maybe see you in left back playing some defense once in a while, uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, so whenever that happens, uh, we'll see you then. Stay safe until then. All right. All right. Looking forward to it, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will see you all next time.